Hello people, this is uh, Dr. Wang here recording. In this uh, video clip, I'm going to talk about chapter one. Chapter one provides an overview of the subject of international finance. This class is different from principles of finance as we all know. So what exactly is it different? The first thing is uh, it talks about multinational corporations instead of just one single entity that operate in only one place. A multinational corporation usually has the businesses uh, in a lot of countries. They have a headquarter in one country. They import uh, raw materials from another country, then sell their product in a third country, and they may find financial sources in a fourth country and so on. And another uh, specialty of this subject is uh, market friction. So market friction comes from uh, different uh, price uh, dynamics for the same kind of products across borders. And there is definitely exchange rate issues. So in this class, we're not just uh, talking about US dollars, but also euros, Japanese yen, Swiss franc, and so on. And what the exchange rate is gonna be, how it's determined, and uh, what would be the volatility and how to control for that risk are all covered in this class. And definitely we will talk about international trade and capital flows. And uh, international finance also offers a investment diversification, which is within the same theme of uh, investment as we learned from uh, the principal finance class. Just uh, we have uh, more opportunities when we diversify internationally. So the exchange rate risk is uh, uh, offered right here. So it is a risk that a foreign currency profits uh, may evaporate in dollar terms due to unanticipated uh, unfavorable exchange rate movements. So what you see here is one example. Let's say if you are a US investor, you hold uh, some dollars and you want to invest in Japan, namely the Toyota stock share. So with the money, you will buy uh, some uh, Japanese shares and uh, assume the stock market is rewarding, you make a 10% return. So uh, with uh, the money, uh, you can buy 10 shares of Toyota and uh, each share is worth uh, 10,000 Japanese yen. With the current US dollar uh, exchange rate, $1 is 100 Japanese yen. So that's going to be $100 per share or $1,000 for 10 shares. And a year later, your investment in Japan will reward your 10% return, so that bring your in initial investment from 100,000 to 110,000, so that looks pretty good. However, what about if the Japanese yen depreciated? That's definitely a bad news for you. So right here, the Japanese yen depreciated uh, from 100 yen to $1 to 120 yen to $1, and although you see the number increase from 100 to 120, but actually, that is appreciation of US dollars. So for each US dollar, it's worth more Japanese yen now than before. So the currency depreciated here is Japanese yen. The currency appreciated is US dollars. So that's our story. So you actually lose money uh, from your uh, exchange uh, of a Japanese yen. I'm not saying that the depreciation of Japanese yen is 20%, not it's not the way we calculated it. I'm gonna talk about that in chapter two. But definitely this uh, depreciation of Japanese yen, although it's not exactly at 20%, it definitely consumed more than 10%. So your Japanese investment is uh, rewarding. It gives you 10% return, but you get hurt from the depreciation of the Japanese currency by more than 10%. So in total, you have a loss. And you need to calculate how to get the loss of it. So if you are um, using this 110,000 yen, you're gonna divide it by 120 um, to see how much US dollar that would be. And you will find out that's definitely less than 10,000 US dollars you started with. The second subject here is uh, political risk. So risk is uh, affected by the political climate of a one particular country with which you have a trade partnership with or you invested in. So the political risk um, could uh, be very damaged for your business. You know, not all countries like the United States uh, who has a very stable political environment 
The political risk usually refers to the legislative bodies, whether it's a dictatorship or democratic uh, environment, and uh, what the policies they make for the physical policies and monetary policies, or whether the military control is enforced in that country, whether your uh, possessions in that country will be forfeited uh, out of a reason. So these are all uh, kind of a risk you need to consider in another country. Another topic of international finance is uh, called uh, market friction. So we need to first understand what perfect market is. That basically refers to the same product priced at the same level everywhere. So if you look at a uh, textbook, like our textbook, if you buy it in Chicago, it's the same amount of dollar. If you buy it in New York or Las Vegas, it's the same amount of dollars. So in the United States, one particular textbook has a perfect market. But that's not the same case if you do the trade internationally. So if you buy the same textbook issued in Europe, that's going to be cheaper than the U.S. If you buy it in Asian countries, same edition, same textbook is going to be cheaper in those countries. So we are the most expensive textbook market. So should we do um, export and import in this regard? Uh, if the, the property issue, intellectual property issue is not a concern, definitely there is. But for textbook, it's a very touchy, so we cannot just uh, uh, outsource the production textbook in another country and then uh, use it in the United States. Uh, another good example would be some electronic stuff like uh, earphones, okay? A earphone like this made in China would uh, cost them like $5, but you can sell it in the United States for $20. And uh, that make a imperfect market. You see same earphone, $5 in China, with considering all the exchange rate issues, is $5 in China, but in the States it's $20. So that's uh, a market uh, imperfection. That means for the same product, the prices are different across borders. And that's gonna uh, be uh, business opportunities. That's why you see the stock prices like Walmart, like Target, has been soaring since the early 90s when they started to outsource in China. But when you see this, uh, uh, still there are some uh, uh, price uh, discrepancies across borders. So that definitely would be related to the issues in legal restrictions, like movement of goods, like laborers, like capital and also transaction costs. There's also a shipping cost. There's also a information asymmetric concerns. So for transaction costs and shipping costs, it's pretty easy to understand. If you ship an oil from the Middle East to the United States in a big cruise, a big cargo, so that's gonna cost you $100,000 each day on the sea. That's a quite a big expenses for us. And also the legal restrictions like labor. You see uh, US is the neighboring with uh, Mexico. You know, the labor rate in Mexico is much lower than the United States. So um, if there's no legal restrictions for uh, immigrations, then what we see here is uh, the labor just to come from Mexico and work in the United States. And then what's that gonna happen? It's gonna make the U.S. wage down and the Mexican wage higher. So eventually, these wages in the two countries will converge. However, because of the law of immigration, this wage conversion would not happen, and that construct our market imperfections. The price discount due to information asymmetry is uh, from the most basic finance theory. So if uh, the buyer and the seller possess different amount of information then the buyer would ask for more discount to compensate something they don't know, something the seller know, but the buyer don't know. It, that happens especially when the buyer and the sellers are at different countries and they have language barriers and that basically exacerbates information asymmetry, then the buyer would ask for more discount uh, when they pay for the uh, price from the seller. And also there is definitely a discriminative uh, uh, taxation. This is a, a very big reflection in the current trade war between US and China. Another example in the financial market, I would uh, read the example of uh, Nestle, which is a, a Swiss company. 
the Nestle company used to have a two classes of stocks traded in the Swiss stock market. One class of Nestle shares is only available to foreigners, and uh, another class is available to Swiss citizens. The foreigners have a bearer shares, and the citizens have a registered shares. The buyer stock is more expensive, so if the foreigners want to invest in Nestle in Switzerland, they have to pay more price. However, on November 18, 1988, Nestle lifted that restriction imposed on foreigners and allowed them to hold the registered share as well as the bearer shares. So when the legal restriction is removed, what would happen? So now both bearer shares and registered shares are treated equally. Um, equally in terms of a cash claim rights. You know, you buy stocks to get a dividends, right? Uh, to get a, a share of the ownership of the company. So in this regard, registered share and the bearer shares are the same. So the citizen share and the foreigner share is the same. So what would happen to the price? The price will convert to the same level. So what you see here is uh, the registered share by the Swiss residents and uh, the bearer share by the foreigners. After the restriction is uh, lifted, what you see is uh, the share price actually convert right there.